to this conference, Globalization and Wealth Cities, Reflections from Sao Paulo. Uh, special welcome uh, to Ambassador Rubens Barbosa from uh, the Brazilian Embassy here in London. Many thanks to the Embassy, to the British Council, uh, to uh, Flame, uh, Friends of Latin America uh, Expression, for supporting uh, this uh, conference which will take place over the next uh, two days. It's a great pleasure uh, for us to be uh, collaborating with uh, Professor Leslie Bethel of uh, the newly created Center for Brazilian Studies, University of Oxford. And I hope that this will be the first of many collaborations uh, uh, that we will have uh, in the future. This uh, conference, in a sense, also uh, for the AA is a continuation of uh, a number of events that have been taking place over the last uh, year and a half, last two years here at the AA. Uh, we have felt uh, that in fact the work of uh, Latin American architects, generally Latin American urbanism, has not been sufficiently uh, investigated and valued and known in the UK and we've made a special commitment to a series of projects uh, over the last uh, two years. It was our honor to have an exhibition, for example, of the Ministry of Education building. And uh, two years ago, during the 150th anniversary of the Architectural Association, uh, the AA awarded a special honorary uh, diploma to Oscar Niemeyer. And so I think that there is a, there's, a, there's been a continuing number of events. And uh, right now, we have an exhibition of young Brazilian architects, which is in our front members room upstairs. So that again is uh, part of a, a series of, of uh, special Brazilian events that have taken place uh, this year. The conference also, in a sense, comes uh, uh, soon after um, a conference that we had about London, called London Postcolonial City. And that was also a collaborative effort with the London Consortium. I think for a school of architecture like the AA, it's a uh, very, very important, it's increasingly important to understand the relationship between the nature of global forces and the way in, in which these forces actually affect the, the work of architects and urbanists on site in the city. Clearly, the responsibilities of the architect because of uh, these forces have changed over the year. And I think that this conference will be very important in terms of establishing some of the circumstances, the criteria, the nuances, uh, that in some ways uh, architects have to uh, respond to. Uh, and I think it will be a very important uh, event for us. Uh, before I uh, ask uh, Professor Bethel, I'd also obviously like to thank our own uh, Housing and Urbanism program for uh, uh, putting uh, the conference together with the <coughs> incredible special support of Elisabetta Andiroli, who was also uh, responsible for much of the AA 150 um, celebrations, so um, uh, I'm very pleased that Elisabetta uh, has a continuing relationship uh, with uh, uh, the AA, and uh, I, I hope that that will, uh, that will continue for, uh, for uh, a long time. So would you please uh, 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 welcome uh, Professor Leslie Bethel to uh, make the introduction. Could I, on, be, on behalf of the Centre for Brazilian Studies at the University of Oxford, also welcome uh, all the visitors to this uh, important symposium, particularly the uh, seven, I think, visitors from Sao Paulo and two uh, distinguished Catalans who will be arriving uh, later today. Uh, the Centre for Brazilian Studies was officially inaugurated by President Fernando Henrique Cardoso in December 1997 during his state visit to the UK. But it began activities in October 97, at the beginning of the 97-98 academic year. And so we're now coming to the end of the center's second year, uh, the second of five years for which initial funding, largely thanks to the efforts of Ambassador Barbosa, uh, the initial funding was secured from two Brazilian government ministries, from the Cultura Inglesa in Sao Paulo and Rio, and from half a dozen private sector companies, notably Organizações Global, and Banco Safra. During the uh, past two years, 
the Centre for Brazilian Studies in Oxford, uh, you'd expect me to say this, of course, I think we've established ourselves as the principal centre for the study of Brazil outside Brazil. And the principal aim is to foster academic research, analysis, debate uh, in Oxford and in the UK generally uh, on Brazilian economic, political, cultural issues and on international issues that have a Brazilian uh, dimension. So we have graduate classes and weekly seminars and we also organise a wide range of conferences and workshops. Uh, last term on the Braz Brazil as an export economy, on human rights and the rule of law, on the future of the PT and the Brazilian left, on globalization, state power, and international institutions. And this term, to give an example, besides today's conference, uh, a conference on race and gender in Brazilian literature, uh, on the impact of the Amazon uh, in the development of science, uh, and on foreign direct investment in the Brazilian economy. We're very pleased to cooperate with other institutions, um, especially in disciplines where Oxford is relatively weak. For example, in October, we're having a joint conference between Oxford and Yale uh, on Brazilian poetry and the problems of translating Brazilian poetry. Uh, and today, of course, we're extremely pleased to be cooperating with the Housing and Urbanism Program uh, of the Architectural Association Graduate School in organizing this international symposium on the city of Sao Paulo, and especially urban planning practices, architecture and design challenges in the development of a city like Sao Paulo, the greatest city uh, in Latin America, of course, in the context of the impact of globalization uh, on major metropolitan centers in the periphery, like Sao Paulo. Uh, I'd also like to thank, I don't need to name them again, but of course we're very grateful to the sponsors of this particular symposium. And I'd like to thank here at the AA in particular, Elisabetta Andrioli, uh, who has organized this symposium on behalf of the Center in Oxford and the AA. And so I'm very happy to uh, dar a palavra uh, to Georges Fiori, the director of the Housing and Urbanism Program here, with whom, as always, it has been a great pleasure to work. Thank you. Um, I went to join Moisson and Leslie in welcoming, welcoming the participants of this symposium and all those attending the symposium and also uh, in thanking all those that have made this symposium possible, um, not least uh, Elisabetta Andreoli, but also Nadia in Oxford and uh, the people in the print studio of the AA, uh, Kate Jones, that work very hard uh, for this symposium to uh, succeed. Um, as you know, the intention of the symposium is to generate a comparative debate on the impact of globalization on cities, and in particular in the so-called world cities, using Sao Paulo as a starting point for that debate. And uh, I want to say very briefly a few words about the focus of the symposium, the intentions, and the questions that we hope to address in the symposium. And for the sake of brevity, I will read my notes. Isn't that too high? Yeah. <coughs> to close up. Yeah. Almost 25 years ago, a book was published in Sao Paulo under the title of Sao Paulo, Economic Growth and Poverty. It involved the participation of leading Brazilian academics and intellectuals, including the current president of Brazil, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and one of the participants in the symposium, Professor Lucio Koverik. Published at the peak of the so-called Brazilian economic miracle, and at a time when the authoritarian regime then in place was starting to lose its grip on power, this book became a landmark in the analysis of Sao Paulo, providing a systematic documentation of the metropolitan region. 
as the most industrialized and economically powerful metropolitan region of Brazil and Latin America, its peculiarity was, according to the authors of the book, the coexistence of its speedy modernization side by side with an increasing levels of poverty, social exclusion, and irregularity. That same year, 25 years ago, the AA Graduate School was created, and our program, Housing and Urbanism, and the direction then of John Turner, received its first group of postgraduate students. From an international comparative perspective, considerable attention was given to the cities of the developing world and to the analysis of issues of urban and housing poverty within them. In that analysis, Sao Paulo came to epitomize that which was seen by many theoreticians at the time as the specificity of peripheral capitalism and peripheral urbanization, i.e., the reproduction of a time of a process of economic modernization and industrialization, which both promoted and benefited from the logic of impoverishment and social exclusion. Indeed, poverty, and in particular urban poverty, as functional to capitalist development at a national and international level. Sao Paulo not only reflected that contradictory processes, but the production of its built environment was also marked by the same perverse logic in a frenzy of speculation, expulsion, and spatial fragmentation. That reality, which was not unique to Sao Paulo, challenged prevailing ideas of the modern city and confronted policymakers and planners with problems which could not be addressed by traditional instruments and tools of planning. The rethinking of planning practice became inexorably linked with the struggle to democratize the state and to change the process of decision making and management at local and national levels as a condition to renegotiate the model of development itself and the forms of insertion into the world economy. 25 years later, Sao Paulo economy has grown considerably together with its population. Its participation in the national product remains substantial even if its composition starts changing with the already established process of deindustrialization. At the same time, Sao Paulo's product, Sao Paulo's economy, has grown bigger than that of many Latin American countries, and its importance at a regional level has increased significantly. And yet, poverty, inequality, and exclusion have not been reduced. Social and spatial fragmentation have increased. Urban violence has become endemic. Vast sectors of the population are continuously denied access to the most basic universal rights of citizenship. But this is no longer Sao Paulo as the heart of a late and incomplete process of integrated national development. This is a Sao Paulo which is rapidly adjusting into the logic of what is becoming a new stage in the internationalization of the world economy, the so-called process of globalization. While nation states are far from dead, and indeed their policies affect very directly the reality of cities, the model of integrated national development is coming to an end with major implications in terms of the nature and future of cities. While globalization is, as no doubt we will be discussing today, a very contradictory and incomplete process, there are undeniable transformations in the world economy which are pointing towards the creation of a new transnationalized network of cities and regions which starts to cut across national boundaries and old divisions of core and periphery, north and south, developing and developing. A complex new geography of inclusions and exclusions is emerging, which, however, permeates the privileged globalized network itself and the spaces where the command and control functions of the world economy are concentrated, the so-called global cities. In the words of Saskia Sassen, who unfortunately is not here today due to ill health, the dynamic of centrality and marginality becomes of the essence of the global cities themselves, at least in the present stage of restructuring of the international economy. Sao Paulo, in this way, is not any longer just an extreme case of social polarization and spatial fragmentation among the industrialized metropolis of the developing world. In its growing articulation with the spaces of power and control in the global economy, it is emerging as an extreme case of polarization and fragmentation among the global cities themselves. Thus, its relevance as a sort of limit case which contains and exposes the contradictory logic of current economic transnationalization. 
If the idea of the modern city as inclusive space at the core of integrated national development is fading, what next? What will be the meaning and nature of future cities, global or not? How inclusive can they be? And what are the social forces and political processes which can rescue the project and vocation of cities as inclusive spaces? While the transnationalization of the economy is advancing, the transnationalization of politics, of identities, and of social movements is still very incipient and tentative. More to the point in our symposium, what is the role of planning and architecture in the search for an inclusive and just city in an increasingly transnationalized economy? If modernist planning has failed to provide the appropriate responses and tools in the past, the abysmal postmodern localized and fragmented interventions under the pretext um, of respect for diversity and oddness have done nothing but aestheticize the exclusion and the status quo. Here lies the merit of strategic planning in its attempt, in a dynamic and flexible manner, to rescue the scale of the city while emphasizing the role of the project as a catalyst and instrument of urban development and transformation. Its contribution at theoretical level, and in a few well-known successful international experiences, has been to articulate the definition of any strategy and project for the city with the redesigning of urban institutions and systems of urban governance, which both express and enable the participation and negotiation of different and conflicting interests in the city. Not surprisingly, however, only too often the discourse of strategic planning has been appropriated and used as yet another tool to strengthen and embellish the globalized niches of our cities in the name of city market, marketing and of unblocking the economic potential of the city. Of one thing we can be certain at the end of this century, unblocking the economic potential of cities, important as it is, does not automatically unblock the obstacles to the eradication of poverty and social exclusion. How and when, therefore, can the successful experiences of strategic planning be replicated? Which are the social and political practices which connect the strategic planning to the real city? How can the theory and practice of strategic planning be further developed and refined? These are some of the questions which we are currently discussing in our program and in the graduate school in the AA today, and which we hope to discuss with you in the symposium today and tomorrow. As you know, the symposium is organized in the form of four panels, three today and one tomorrow, with panelists making uh, a relatively brief, short uh, presentations to be followed by a debate among panelists and with the public. I uh, introduce now to you uh, the next speaker, Professor Raquel Ronick, an architect and planner, director of the postgraduate school um, uh, the, in, the, in, the, in the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism of the Catholic University of Campinas. Raquel was also the former head of the Strategic Plan of São Paulo and is currently uh, uh, advising the uh, uh, city of Santo André um, um, in the preparation of their own plan. Uh, so I pass the word to Raquel. Raquel. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to thank a lot our hosts, uh, Mohsen Mustafavi from AA, Jorge Fiori, and also Leslie Betel from the Center for Brazilian Studies for the opportunity of being here and discussing with you the topic of globalization and the case of Sao Paulo. Second, of course, I would apologize for my English 
which is rather a bad American <laughs> and not English. And um, my task here is, is very difficult because I tried to give you a picture, especially for those who don't know Sao Paulo, of what is Sao Paulo, a global mega city of 16 million inhabitants. Um, generally speaking, with more than 100 kilometers of daily traffic jams and incredible floods every rainy season which paralyze the city and one million people living in shanty towns and at the same time the same city as we can see with some indicators of a globalized of the internationalization of the city and the concentration of capital in the city we can see here international phone calls by thousands, how the city of Sao Paulo, and now I have to point out we have the city of Sao Paulo, which is the central city of the metropolitan region. The city of Sao Paulo itself has 10 million people, and the metropolitan region, 16 million people. So the city itself concentrates almost 40% of all international calls of uh, Brazil. In, and it has increasing his numbers and participation. In terms of air traffic and international passengers, the airport of Sao Paulo, Guarulhos, um, it has increased also his participations in the share of the total international movement. Um, so it has from one million and a half uh, uh, trips compared to Galeão in Rio de Janeiro, which has 2,300,000 uh, passengers in 89, to 2,593,000 and almost 6,000,000 in 96, just until November, which is not including December, which is a very, very busy month for international passengers. And all the rest, of Brazilian airports besides Rio in Sao Paulo has in 96 702,000 international passengers. So from this we can see a little bit how a capital and how internationalization is concentrated in Sao Paulo. Then we can see here also if I'm looking for signs of globalization, high technology, internationalization that we can point out placing Sao Paulo as a global city. So in terms of uh, the share of Brazilian market on high technology manufacture and services, we can see data processing in the city of Sao Paulo has 40% of, of uh, Brazilian market, technical 727, software 41, microelectronics 65.8, telematics 25.7. Well, in the side we have the inland of the state of Sao Paulo, which has significant poles of industrialization and high tech uh, industrialization, and which are very much connected to Sao Paulo in terms of management, finance, and, and so, so on. Then in terms of uh, financial operations also, uh, Sao Paulo, this, uh, the metropolitan region, has 90% uh, of total uh, state of Sao Paulo deposit. This is a little bit to counterpoint the idea of that the deindustrialization of Sao Paulo uh, really didn't meant uh, the, lo the loss of power in terms of capital concentration and also credit operations and uh, stock markets, which are significant. So we have a dual image of an economically powerful city, cosmopolitan, linked to international flows of capital and culture, and at the same time, a hell of a living space where life is in danger and urban living is risky. The common sense 
would explain this apparent paradox as the example of a, an absolute lack of urban planning. So the idea is that we don't have urban planning. That's why Sao Paulo is a chaos now. Um, but what I would try to point out, uh, to show here, is that first, Sao Paulo had planning, plans and urban regulations. And it, it is regulated by an urban legal order strongly rooted in the principles formulated at the beginning of the century. And second, the city problems they have to do with historical concentration of income and wealth, as everybody knows, and the presence of poverty, but also to urban policies practiced over the century. So what I would try to point out is that what is the connections between urban planning practices, urban policies, and the actual state of the city, or what I call territorial exclusion in the city. So in order to understand that, we have to go back in the beginning of the century when Sao Paulo began to grow. And we, we can see from the beginning of the century a pattern, of a construction of a pattern of territorial exclusion. So we have to go back long before the economic miracle in the 70s and long, long before globalization and structural adjustment in order to understand what is the dynamics of the city. So just to show um, Sao Paulo in 8081, because it was the moment where the city um, had started to grow very rapidly, connected to coffee plantations in the inland. Sao Paulo was the center, the man management and the financial center for the coffee growing regions. And also an incredible influx of immigrants uh, entered to Sao Paulo, replacing uh, slave work that was abolished by that time. And in terms of the city structure, which is very important to understand geographically, Sao Paulo has hills, and this is the central hill where the city was born, and valleys. So the railroads that came with coffee plantations, they established themselves in the valleys for engineering reasons, obvious engineering reasons. So the valley, and we can see here um, the railroad in 81, that linked Sao Paulo to the port of Santos and that linked Sao Paulo with the regions that produced coffee. So uh, alongside these valleys, we can see here an image of the city in 1900. The city established its first manufacturers, manufacturing industry along the railroad, and that was also the place where uh, the working class neighborhoods were formed in the beginning of the century. And at the same time, in the city center, we had a first change in the city center from the mixture of uses and social classes. We had, for the first time, uh, the elite, the coffee elite, uh, abandon the historical center to establish a exclusive residential neighborhood, this concept of exclusive uh, only residential neighborhood, which was in Campos Elysius here. And for the first time in 1898, a urban regulation law regulating way of of occupying parcels were established just for Campos Elysius neighborhood, saying that the minimum wide of the lots was that, the use, the exclusive use was residential. So the first 
zoning law was established expect only for Campos Elysius in order to guarantee that the neighborhood was made for the elite and not for tenement houses, which was the rule of the working class housing by the time and small rented, really small rented uh, houses, which was uh, in all this area, this eastern and southeastern area of the city. In 1900 also Avenida Paulista, which became a very important avenue, was also opened for a, also as an exclusive residential neighborhood. And the city center, and here we have images of the city center in the beginning uh, uh, of the century, was designed and invested by urban design, by urban planning, as an image of a civilized center, and civilized by the time meant French, something that looked look like Paris. So the municipal theater was a copy of the opera of Paris, and Bouvard was the designer of uh, the city park uh, in, this, in, the, in the central area. And at the same time, you can see some images of this plan, and at the same time, a urban perimeter was established in the city and the urban perimeter was established for two reasons. One, because services like lighting, water, sewage were, were delivered by private companies. English, by the way. Uh, light and power was um, uh, the company who delivered electricity and was responsible for trolley lines, also was an Anglo-Canadian company. And uh, the urban perimeter was established in order to establish the area in which the company was obliged to deliver the, the, the services. So that was for that reason, but also there was the first laws regarding to housing that prohibited the constructions of tenements in the city? No, in the urban perimeter. So what happened is that all the tenements from that moment on was built outside the urban perimeter, who existed by that time as we can see here in this image. So the result very quickly here, we can see the water supply network in 1900 more or less have to do with the urban perimeter. And we have a lot of neighborhoods in the east and in the southeast and extreme west who exist. And there was a lot of people and there was no water system. And generically, the same with the sewage network the same with lighting. I have to point out that Paulista had no houses whatsoever and it had water, sewage, lighting and trolleys. And there was a lot of there was a lot of of working class neighborhood with no infrastructure. And of course because of that a lot of epidemics epidemics like yellow fever and other diseases that are clearly linked to sanitation conditions. The only service that was really delivered <laughs> to working class neighborhoods was trolley lines and transportation because that was essential in order to provide the movement and influx and this is the pattern that we can follow over the, the century in Sao Paulo, we see no investments, no urban investments at all at working class neighborhood, except for some investment in transportation, which is the condition to get out <laughs> of the neighborhood 
to go um, to work. So trolley lines were significantly, we could see here in this picture, they covered significant, significantly the whole city. And here we can see in the image of 1914, and in 1914, the city grew, and in terms of, of numbers, the population, um, we, have, we had already 250,000 people by the end uh, of the century. I forgot to say that Sao Paulo before that, in 1873, had 30,000 people living. So it was a big, big, rapid um, grow. So um, here, the pattern that we had with the city with trains, trolley lines, rented houses, and tenements was a very dense and compact city. The city reached the density of 110 inhabitants per hectare in the, the end of, of the 20s. So it was very, very packed and, and, and very dense. And um, of course, it was a city of immigrants. Just to give you an idea of, of, of this, and especially Italians, Portuguese, and, and Spanish, um, in the decade from 8088 to 8090, 157,000. Among them, almost 80% Italians. Then the next decade, 733,000. And until the 20s, uh, 857,000. And a more distributed uh, origin among Italians, Portuguese, and Spanish. So basically, working class neighborhoods were basically f made of foreigners, of immigrants. And this has a lot to do with the, the structure, the territorial structure of the city. Because during the First Republic, which is the, the phase that we are talking about until the 30s, um, in order to vote, um, you had to be first men, not women, second Brazilian, and literate. So if we see the composition of the city in terms of immigrants, and we can see the amount of illiterates, of foreigners, and of course of, of women in the city, very few people vote, simply. So, the, uh, the, of course, we, we are under the banner of a liberal state, and a, li a liberal state for whom the social question just didn't exist. But the base for that is that working class neighborhood didn't vote and didn't really meant anything for the decision making process of the city. So that's why it was very possible to maintain a structure, a very concentrated structure. And by the time we started to build what I call our Berlin Wall, which is the wall, the invisible wall that separates in the city, a part which is formal, services, serviced and invested by urban planning and urban regulations, and which separates the other part of the city, which is the east and the southeastern part, generically speaking, which has no services, which is irregular, which is um, very poorly designed historically. Now, we're gonna make a big change, a shift in the pattern of organization. It's important that in each time, in each period, we started to construct part of our paradigm. So I was mentioning our Berlin Wall because this was maintained through the century. But now we have a second moment, which is beginning of the 30s. As we can see here, all of a sudden, we have a spread 
of the city. And a, a, a shift from the pattern of train, trolley, tenement houses, rented small houses, into a new pattern of self-help private house building in the periphery. Own house, own houses for the working class building in the rural areas, in distant peripheries, step by step, slowly over the years by the family, it's, uh, by this, the family itself. So this shift has the crisis of the 20s, which is a long process and I have no time to explain that. It was a crisis, it was a political crisis in terms of the elite which was in power, the coffee elite and its position. It has to do the international idea of an intervening state against the liberal idea, the previous liberal idea, but it has to do a lot with the lack of houses, the deficit of housing uh, in the 20s and, and, the, and the demographic growth in the 20s, but also it has to do with the entry of buses, in the first time buses mounted on Ford trucks. So irregular buses. And the regular buses, they entered in the city in the 20s because the transportation network of light and power company was not supplying the service. And it was a, cri it was a crisis because light and power was much more interested in generating electricity and investing in the whole system of generating electricity in Sao Paulo, which is a very complex work of engineering, uh, rather than investing in transportation, in the trolley lines, and especially because the price of trolley, of, of, um, of trolley the, the price of the token was frozen since the beginning of the century. So it was a crisis of investment and we had a shift from the patterns of trains and trolleys to buses and private cars. So, and the horizontal spreading of the city, which is very important. So what it has to do with planning? By that time, we had one of the only urban plans for the whole city that in a way it is in force until today, which is Prestes Maya Avenues plant, which is basically the idea that the city could spread horizontally, and it is okay, and um, as long as a system of radial avenues intercepted by perimeter avenues could follow the spreading. This is the idea, and the idea was, uh, was put in practice, and, and the idea has, in terms of conception of urban planning, the idea of horizontal spreading. And it has a lot to do, in per very perverse terms, with the process of self-help construction in the periphery, in parceling with no infrastructure and whatsoever. Just to follow here what we had, water supply network in 28 when the city was, so the, the distance between served and unserved uh, areas was growing. Sewage network, <coughs> more or less the same thing. And here we can see in the 30s, what were the zones which are in gray here that were in a way protected by law or defined its use and occupation by law and the rest was the rest, basically. So, and also if we see here, just to, to show that where there were the areas of concentration of permits in terms of right to build. 
and where were the areas of demographic growth. Demographic growth was outside the areas of concentration of permits. So this dual regular, irregular pattern of the city was established uh, very clearly in the 30s. Here we have an image of the city by the end uh, of the 30s. So, what we have in the 30s is a new political style, a defense of state intervention. We are under Getulio Vargas uh, and against the liberal conception of the First Republic. And also, by that time, urban masses began to be important for politics, especially because we have a growing number of Brazilian, of voters, second generation, third generation of, of immigrants, which started to vote, which started to count, and to claim for services in their neighborhoods, for water, for paved streets, for public lighting. But how could the state supply services if all parcels and homes were illegal and had nothing to do in terms of construction and design with the standards of the companies. So that was a big issue, a big debate in the 30s. And the response of this debate is very important to understand what happened afterwards. Beginning in the 30s, a territorial pact was established where illegality was tolerated in order to be negotiated later by the state. One of the conditions of this pact was that the state would assume the role of provider and residents of the legal territory the role of debtors for receiving favors from the state since from a strictly legal point of view they would deserve punishment because they were illegal. But instead of punishment, they would deserve a favor that the state would tolerate and eventually would extend infrastructure step by step, traded by political support, clearly. So this territorial pact that was really established in the 30s, but then the uh, the dictatorship of, of uh, Getulio Vargas started, so it was not really put in practice, but uh, it was really fully established during the redemocratization process, whereby urban improvements were transformed into votes and neighborhood leaders into cabos eleitorais, representatives of council people in the neighborhood trading uh, with votes. So uh, then we have in the 30s or 40s a period of transformation of a structural character and uh, because of, and I have no time to explain that, but of enormous flux of capital enter into building construction in the 40s in Sao Paulo and Rio especially. So that was a time of the beginning of verticalization of the city, the construction of skyscrapers in the city, in the city center. And what we have here is the replacement from the foreign immigrant by the Brazilian migrant. And so an enormous influx, these are, are data of the state of Sao Paulo, not of the city of Sao Paulo, but just to give you an image of the replacement, of the total replacement for foreign uh, to Brazilian uh, migrants. You see in the 60s, more than 3 million people came from, especially from Minas Gerais and the Northeast to Sao Paulo State and to Sao Paulo uh, City also. Especially in the 50s and the 60s. So if we see now in a different scale where we can see the city 
of Sao Paulo, the metropolitan region, from the beginning of 19th century until the 30s, just to see where railroads, the red spots, were established, and then uh, here in the 30s, the last image that we have, Sao Paulo in the 30s, how was it in terms of the structure of uh, the metropolitan region? Then we can follow in a different scale because the city was so wide <laughs> that we have to deal now with the image of the metropolitan region. Again, the 30s, 54, 68, 92 in terms of uh, urbanization, the urbanized uh, area. We can see here in the 50s the construction of a road to the port, which is Anchieta, a road to Rio, which is Dutra, and a road to the interland of Sao Paulo, which is Anhanguera, and this shift from train to roads also, and that led to a industrialization along the roads in the ABC area, in the Guarulhos area, and also here uh, in the Osasco area. So we can see here in the 68, the expansion in Osasco, in ABC area, in Guarulhos, outside the city of Sao Paulo, in, former, in places that existed before as independent city and, and villages. And all this spreading was basically made by auto construction, self-help housing, and irregular uh, parceling. So, and that were from, especially from the 50s on, uh, we had amnesties of different rings. Every time a different ring, an amnesty in order to incorporate this part of the city, and always the urbanization was long after <laughs> the area of amnesty. Including, if we see here, in the, in the 70s, uh, the popular, a popular uh, housing program of uh, National Housing Bank uh, established big, big uh, um, housing programs in the far eastern part of Sao Paulo, just to show you. So it's more or less how the periphery looks. <laughs> a neighborhood in the periphery in the beginning of occupation. These images came from Osasco, in the metropolitan region. But this is very typical of a, a uh, periphery neighborhood in the beginning, not consolidated. And these are the image of Coab houses, of, of the BNH uh, National Bank housing. Eh? National? National Housing Bank style. Far away in, in the periphery, in the rural areas. And it's amazing zoning by the time in 72 a zoning law encompassing zoning law for the whole city was established and it was a special chapter of this zoning law which is in order to provide cheap land for popular housing a category in the first fringe of rural area was established this category um, was that it was rural land, nobody could urbanize except uh, municipalities and states in order to use financement of the National Bank. So this was one of the um, policies which were responsible for the horizontal spreading of non-urbanized areas. So this is not lack of planning. 
this is the presence, a very clear presence of, of planning. And so just to see where the vertical um, growth took place in the city from the 20s when it began until 94. So what we can basically see here is the concentration not working anymore. The concentration of vertical growth in the center southwestern vector. So now is less clear in the 80s. So this is the beginning of a change that is taking place, which I'm going to very, very quickly show you in order to finish uh, my presentation. So this is the southwestern vector, <laughs> where uh, this is Paulista in after the big change in Paulista, Avenida Paulista in the 70s. This argument, the concentration of cultural, educational, jobs, and any kind of opportunities in the center southwestern part, which is red. The red is commercial use. The, I don't know what's the name of this color in English. <laughs> Could be yellow, no. <laughs> Okra. Or verde musgo. <laughs> so here is residential, pure residential. The red is commercial, and the black is industrial. The industrial areas. This is it's very, it's not clear because this is the verticalized area and the colors, they, they mixed here, so it's not very good. So this is in 68, so we can see uh, how much non-residential use is concentrated and the rest is pure uh, residential with no network of public transportation whatsoever. <laughs> because from that point on was pure buses and cars. So this is 93, how we can see here um, industrial areas which are here. They are, they are getting smaller. Commercial area is spreading a little bit, but inside the southwestern vector, <laughs> spreading over the southwestern vector, which is uh, the structure. So what is going on now? We can see uh, clearly that Sao Paulo metropolitan re uh, region is losing secondary activities and gaining tertiary activities. So this is uh, very clear. So we can see this more clearly, how manufacturing in the metropolitan region is going down from 87 to 97. Retail and services is going up. The industrialization of the, ci of, of the metropolitan region, not only of the city. But this I image is very in interesting to show where and how this process is taking place. This is employment density or employment per hectare. So we can see here the concentration of jobs and then the lack, the absolute lack of jobs. Who is more acute now with tertiarization because the industrial, the industry was occupying the valleys. So if the industry is going out and the commerce and services is growing, we have even more concentration in the southwestern vector. So that was an image of 87, and this is an image of 97. We can see a spreading of the jobs compared to the anterior image. There is a spreading of the job, but the difference between the peripheries and the center is more acute. We have even more concentration 
in the southwestern vector of the metropolitan region. So, I mean, traffic jams is so evident. <laughs> How can you take three million, four million people a day, every day in the morning, to go to travel to the center and southwestern part of the city and then take them back? And how this pattern deteriorates not only the life and, and people of the periphery, but also the center, who concentrates so much. Uh, so just to finish uh, uh, in the city with some